So, uh, my name is Juhani. Um, um, firstly, I would apologize. I'm feeling a little bit under the weather. So my presentation is going to be sponsored by Troido Energy Drink. Um, first, a little bit about myself. Um, I work at Snap TV, it's a UK startup. Um, I've written a book, it's called Smashing Energy UI. Uh, it should be out everywhere now. Um, I write a blog about Android UI patterns. Um, and generally I go to the internet complain about app quality. Um, I also lately started creating a tabletop gaming system that combines tablet UI, some Android, and, and so on. Not going to talk about that today. Um, today is going to be about um, differences in or, or what to do in Android UI and what not to do. I'm not going to go into details and technically. This is going to be very non-technical. I think I have two lines of code. Um, so I'm going to talk bring up points what you should do, should do or what should, you should not do um, when you build your application and design your applications. Let's go over really quickly who, who you are because I really was difficult to figure out uh, who to design for. Uh, how many of you are designers? Perfect. I've given this presentation a couple of times and first time there was two and second time was one. Um, so now I have something like seven, which is great. Uh, I assume the rest of us are uh, developers. Uh, okay, um, so just to go quickly, these are things that everybody in Troy can understand, so I'm going to get quickly the first points and then we can talk about a little bit more about the further next points. Um, different hardware, right? We also all have the F word called fragmentation and, um, and so on. Right? You can't assume what kind of hardware you're building for, but that's, that's no news for everybody here. Um, software, right? Um, we have these different skins that OEMs force on us. Um, interestingly, um, if you look at the, the Facebook phone that was announced HTC first, um, it's actually a stock phone. Uh, so it's first HTC phone after uh, Nexus One that is stock. Um, but anyways, uh, you can't assume when you design your software uh, for for these phones, especially now that the Facebook phone is out there. Um, you can't assume that the launcher looks the same. You can't assume that the workflow of the users are going to be the same. Uh, they might use it very differently. Um, and even if you if you go to a stock stock Android experience like uh, like Galaxy Nexus or Nexus 4, um, you can't assume that that those users use the same thing. So these are all, all different custom launchers you can install. I think most of us have tried some of them. Um, Keyboards. Um, keyboards, you can't assume that um, people are going to write your text one letter at a time. Right? Um, how many of you have tried that one there, which is called Cine keyboard? A couple of them. So that's actually quite cool experiment. It's useless, but it's cooler. Um, so you can type, it guesses what kind of things you, you want to type, and it's, you just each tap is one whole word. Um, you can download themes to it, like gangster themes or something like that. Um, and of course, the speak and speech and so on. Um, so you can't assume that users are typing in the words. They might be doing something fully different. And then this thing. Um, this is the latest number. Google, I think, took a step the right direction, um, uh, kind of calculating the numbers a bit differently. So now they do only the people who actually manually go to Google Play Store is is in this chart. So that inflated jelly bean of Android ICS bus a bit more. Um, is, is Marcus Junge here? No. But his presentation yesterday, he, he pointed out that the, on their application, this looks completely different. Uh, they have like, I think, 70% ICS plus and so on. I expect, I think, personally, I think that, uh, that ICS plus is most of the applications that are being installed because the old phones are so crap that people don't want to install anything for them anyways. Uh, follow the guidelines. Uh, Google has given us this. Uh, no, I don't know how to get rid of this thing. But Google has given the, the design guidelines. Read those; they are really easy to read. Uh, it's worth taking the time go through every single page of them, um, and do what they ask. Um, designing for users. This is kind of important point. This is the first first point. I kind of beyond what we all know already. I think. Um, it's important that you don't design yourself for yourself. 
unless you're making the application for yourself, right? Uh, most of us aren't. So think about how, what, what ways you can design for users instead of for yourself. Um, we use, in our company, we use something called user-centered design. It's not actually an exact term. There's multiple different ways of doing user-centered design. What we do, we, we take, we create these kind of, um, we call them personas, or they're called personas, um, which, is, uh, which is a kind of abstract user. Um, it's not actually abstract user as such. It's a, it's a concrete abstract user. So you create this group of people, you figure out this archetype of users, and then you create a single concrete user. It's a fictional. You go to Google, Google um, picture, of, and you find picture of the user, and give them name, you give them family, and so on. Um, it sounds maybe maybe sounds stupid to some people, but it's actually worth doing. What you are doing then is to you create these people who aren't real, so you can talk about them really easily. You can't offend anybody if they don't exist. Um, but you can design for them people. So you can talk about how would Josh use this thing, um, and so on, right? Um, and then you can actually simulate their experience without actually having the users there. Um, we also write goals, user goals. Um, I'm not going to go in deeply into this topic, because this could be a whole day talking about users and design. But user goals, what I mean is that you create text textual description of what the users actually want to do without describing ev any single feature of the application. So users want to save is not actually user goal, because that describes they want to save. What users want to do, they want to keep their data. Right? Um, so that's actually a very useful exercise. That is defining the application UI without designing it by accident. If you go there, if you go into meeting room, you start talking about application functionality and so on, you accidentally design the UI and it's probably going to be crap. So first, describe what the users want to do with your application, then design the UI for that. But there's, there's a lot of material about users and the designs worth, worth checking out. Um, this is super important, important. You are not your users. This is, these are a couple of comments from my blog where I complained about Android back button. Um, I still feel that it's a mess. Um, I don't have a problem with that. I find that easy. So on, right? If, if these are your comments, somebody sitting here, this is not meant to offend anybody. That's what's point out that if you don't have a problem with the concept, that doesn't mean it's actually easy to use. You just understand what is an activity, right? Users don't know what is an activity. If back button always terminates the current activity, that doesn't mean anything for users. Other point, other very important point is that your users are not designers, right? So these are a couple of comments from random applications on, on, on Play. And they're basically a feature request. And the easiest way to destroy your application is go to your feedback or something and implement everything users ask exactly the way the users ask them. You think about, OK, if I create this thing, those users are going to be happy. They probably won't, and everybody else will be pissed off anyways. Um, what you should do, I'm not saying you shouldn't listen to your users. You definitely should listen to your users. But what I'm proposing is that you go through your feedback, ask for feedback, and then take a step back and figure out what the users actually want to do. We go to the goal point again. So you find a feedback saying, I, I need to be able to do this on the application. Step back and figure out what is the general thing is. And then you are the designer. You understand, is that actually part of your application? Right? It's not wrong to say that my application is not supposed to do that. If you just arbitrarily add things to the application, um, that is going to bloat the app. Everybody's used Microsoft Office. It's impossible to use because they've done exactly this. And that adds everything. Right? Um, go to go to the next step. Uh, this is my pet peeve. Um, don't do this way. Um, and to be fair to IKEA, they have fixed this, but I will never delete this slide. Uh, I will always make fun of them. Um, which is which, right? It's real, iOS was massively popular for some time ago. Um, it still is, but we are leading now. We should go Android first, but probably won't, because there's more money on the iOS side. If you have an iOS application, do not port it like this to Android. And if you have problem convincing your business side of things why you shouldn't do this, 
tell them this, right? And this really is that one. This, this situation has now been fixed, but this was when this application was done. I took this. If you went to Google Play and typed search IKEA, their official application wasn't on the first page. Think about it. If you, if you run a business and somebody goes and looks for your thing and it won't even come up there, you're going to lose the business. You might as well not have the application. Do a proper application. Don't do crap. Um, I'm going to go back to this. So I've been, um, I've been fighting against these hybrid network, phone gaps, all those things. Uh, I've, I've wrote about it. I managed to piss off some people. Um, they might be here. I don't know. Um, in my opinion, you should you'd never use them. Uh, there's no good, no, there's no good reason to use any of these hybrid networks, no frameworks. The reason is that the user experience is so different on these platforms that it's not enough just to move components around um, or change their look. The applications work really differently. On the other hand, this, if you if you look at PhoneGap, I think in my opinion. It's not possible to make a good application with PhoneGap at all. I think it's never use it. The reason is that it will always feel strange. Even if it looked exactly right, the user will go, it doesn't feel right. There's something in the feel of the application as it goes from. Then there's the other frameworks like, like Absolute or Titanium, which um, I was told that it's possible to do. Uh, I keep asking people to say, OK, send me one application that is great, and I change my mind. Um, I'm open to changing my mind, but for this, until today, I haven't seen a single application that's actually good. Um, there are other frameworks I've seen better applications, like the, the Mono one and so on. But, but anyways, write native. Don't write with this crap. Um, don't build a tablet application. This is something that, that Andrew Rubin said, and uh, probably most misunderstood quote of the Android world. Um, you can't do phone and tablet. You should build a scalable UI. There's no such thing as Android tablet. You don't know where the line goes to. Is it is the is the Note a tablet? I don't know. It's definitely not a tablet. Um, you need to design for the continuum, and there's good ways to do it. So you cannot go, okay, I have this tablet application, and every 10-inch tablet is going to be this, and everything else is going to be phone phone application. Samsung just released 8.1 tablet, is that going to be the 10-inch tablet or 7-inch and so on, right? There's a, there's a continuum of things. Um, so it doesn't mean that you shouldn't do anything. This is the thing that Apple wants to show us. Um, Twitter actually updated their application like last week, and it still looks like this on tablets. This is the old screen that it does look like this. So you need to do something. What Andrew Rubin said wasn't that you shouldn't improve your application. You didn't say make your application scalable. It's say, don't build two applications. Build one that scales. There's a lot of good things. So, so called, but this is a term called responsive design. How many of you have heard about responsive design? Awesome, all of it. Um, so, I'm just going to go through this quickly. Quick, quickly. Um, so, these are some examples you can think about. Um, this would be a topic for a whole presentation as well. So, the web approach for responsive design is to move the components around on bigger screens and so on. Um, like Google Play does. Uh, this is now old. I haven't got the update yet. Um, I haven't played around the, the one that was released yesterday. But anyways, Google does this on Google Play. I, I think they still do in the, in the new version. Um, basically, you have these components. You shape them again and put the exact same components on the screen. Uh, Google Play, this old version of Google Play was actually quite interesting. They didn't really change the depth of the application at all. They just relay other things, mostly. So they move, move these components around. Um, second approach, this is the easiest, easiest responsive design approach. It's the kind of, I would like to call it 3D, responsive design in 3D, because you basically go, you don't go sideways, you go in depth ways. So tasks, one of my favorite applications, um, they do this thing, uh, most applications, do, like Google Mail, most applications do. So basically, on, on phone, you have two screens. On tablet, you have one side by side, very easy to do. This is actually not part of a template in the, in the SDK or the, or the ADT, uh, if you install the Eclipse, Eclipse plugins, and, and you just go, it's called master detail, right? They have this template. You can go and create new project or new activity, and you say, I'm going to use the template master detail, and it will create everything for you for this. And then you can start building your application on top of it. 
is worth doing. Uh, then there's things, things about like thinking about uh, optional context, content. Um, Aldeco, um, they have some things on the tablet screen that they don't put on the phone screen at all because they don't feel like it needs to be there. Um, so these things are, are something, something that you can, can think about. Um, there's, there's tons more we can, we can talk about, but I just wanted to give a quick pointer. Create your application scalably. Um, that also means that you need to use your scalable layout in each of the sections. Um, go through the layout managers Google has, has given us. Uh, you can also write your own, but you never really need to. Um, if you don't know relative layout, you probably all do. But if you don't, really read it. Even if you're a designer, ask a developer describe to you what relative layout does. Um, the whole point of the responsive uh, design is um, that you create these different sections that can scale. You don't create one UI and then one UI and one UI for each of the, each of the tablets or each of the sizes. What you do, you create multiple, multiple sections of UI that stretch independently. So it's, for example, this simple UI here, it has minimum width when the, some of the columns become too small that it's unusable, and it's a maximum width. When, when it's too wide and the content is spread, spread too thin. Um, and from here, what you do, you go, go through the points and see where it's too small, there you need to have a re, kind of free layout point to figure out another, another layout and so on. So try to figure out co responsive and stretchable layouts and find the real layout points by figuring out when does it look crap and when, when it's good. A um, couple of really simple points, don't lock the portrait. Um, I don't know if you, if Flipboard has fixed this, probably has, right? But the one Flipboard announced or released uh, on 10 inch, it was always like this. Um, some, some devices are used in landscape, never lock in the portrait. Uh, it's really bad. Um, so these are, these are examples that people use. Even the phones, some people, I had Detroit or Milestone, um, was always landscape, right? Um, you need to support multiple screen densities. Um, this is a, a bit more complex topic, but then I think this crowd, I think everybody knows about it already. Because um, your finger doesn't scale, that's the point. Uh, when you have different densities, it means that you have more pixels in the same area of the screen. And you need to figure out how to do, how to make the apps look the same physical size. On Android, you always design for physical size, you never design for pixels. So this kind of demonstrates it. On this, this left side, I have, uh, I think the t top one is, uh, is Detroit, uh, which is high density screen, and the low one is Legend, which is medium density screen. And they are side by side. You see that the UI is actually the same size. It's very close to the same size. And Android takes care of it if you, if you build the code correctly. But this then, on the right side, they have screenshots from the same devices. You see that the the legend one is actually really a lot smaller. That comes from the screen density. It has less pixels, so each pixel is larger. So the, so the UI ends up being same size. Um, what you can do, you can provide different kind of different assets for them. Um, so mean, mean that uh, Android does this automatically for you, but if you don't, don't do this, um, they, they scale the assets correctly, so they will always be same physical size on different things. But you can, you can give, create multiple different images for you for you, UI, so you can actually, you know, so they, different these screen densities, they always look the same physical size. This is just examples from the, from, the, from the code. But I think you guys all, all know about this already. Um, when you write your layout, always use DPs, never use anything else, or use SP for the, code, for the text. Um, I think this is probably the only line of code I have in the, in the thing. So the well, DP is something that's for new developers is actually very difficult to understand. And that is something that's been a problem with between designers and developers. Like how do designers dis define the layouts that they are actually DPs? Because the designers don't want to spend time doing the math, figuring out which is which, which they shouldn't be doing. We as developers should give them a guideline, say, okay, you need to do this. So what I've done in, in my company is that I always tell my designers to design in MDP. Uh, so MDPI, you go and you get, for example, one of the old 10-inch tablets, they are all MDPI. You figure out what is the MDPI of, of your phone, if this was, was MDPI, and they'll tell them, okay, just design for them, they can go to Photoshop, design for pixels, and what you do, you get sizes, and then you just change some DPs, and they will always work correctly. 
So this bottom line here is the key. One DP means one pixel on an MDPI screen. So when you talk to designers, talk about MDPI screens, and they don't have to worry about the other ones until they start creating the assets, but then that's a different story. Um, graphics, um, some, some images cannot be stretched. Um, that's why we have different tools like Nine Patch. How many of you have used Nine Patch? Perfect. Uh, so I don't have to explain what it is. This is a this is thing that came from web for us because you have pictures you cannot stretch. So you define stretch points to the to the system, and it stretches only the things that that don't break the, the curvature of the things or on unscalable bits. There's the Android SDK in the tools folders. You have a tool called Draw Nine Patch, which you can can open any image. <coughs> Which I found actually in the latest versions is that sometimes the there's something wrong with the with the nine patch assets, but you should open the you can op if you if the app doesn't scale them correctly, just open them in a draw nine patch, save them back in, and that usually fixes the issue. Uh, and then there's other things like what we developers can do when when designers come up come up with ideas, saying okay, we want to have these kind of diagonal lines and and gradients and all that stuff, and then we go like oh, we can scale them so. I don't know how to do this because we can't really have massive background images going to eat all the memory and everything is going to start crashing. What you can do, you can figure out a lot of this painting or this drawing tools in the Android, you can do them in, in XML. So look at, look at a lot of these things like uh, you can have, for, the, for example, this image is made, this background here is made with the with 10 by 10 pixels, pixel line that is just tiled and then I draw a gradient on top of it. So both of these you can do in the XML code, and it just doesn't actually use that much memory and scales to every single device because it also just tiles the, tiles the background. So if your designer come up with an idea that sounds like you cannot do it, there's probably still a way to do it. You just need to dig into the drawing tools and those things. So default themes. This is something actually, but I'm kind of happy to say that this is going away now. Um, so this is the same application running on the running on 2.3 and running on Ice Cream Sandwich. Um, it's actually the same ap application. There's nothing, nothing different in them. They look totally different. Um, that is something that we've had had long discussions with our designers figuring out what is the right way to do it. There's no right answer. There's two answers that are both bad. Uh, one thing is to, you can backport. There's a library called Holo everywhere, I think. We can backport to Holo to 2.3. That's bad because your application will look wrong on that phone. Um, if you have an HTC, it doesn't have the green highlights anymore and so on. Then again, if you don't do that, your application will look different on every single phone and your designers go mad because they, they don't get the pixel perfection they want to have. Um, personally, um, I have started designing or, or building only for 4.0+. I, I think 2.3 is so old we can start to slowly, it depends on your business, but if you're creating something that isn't so critical, then you just go, okay, 4.0. 2.3 users probably won't install so many, so many applications anyways, and their phones are bad and old. Um, navigation, this is my, the pet peeve I also already mentioned. Um, so this is from the picture from Google's Google documentation, and I talked about different, different Google guys and talked with different thing, different people, probably some of you in here, in Google Plus, and uh, I think the app navigation, the back navigation, home home navigation, multitasking, they all create it, make it very different for users to understand where they are in the application, what happens on the next button. If you look on your phone, you have a back button there. Many times you don't know what will happen when you press it, and that's bad UI. I think you should always look at the UI and you should know everything. You know exactly what's going to happen when I do this and when I do this. Back button you don't, and up button you don't. Um, however, there's guidelines now for the for the up button, and and you should follow them. Um, I don't fully agree with them. I've been fighting with the Google guys about that, and I know I will not win. So I just I'm just going to follow their guidelines. Um, that's at least we're going to end up with a lot of applications that behave the same way, and users will learn it. So. Follow the guidelines that are in the design guideline documentation. Um, this is something that has happened. Um, this is related to navigation, and, and it's called drawer navigation. Is, I think is the name of the pattern that we ended up with, um, because it's like drawer where you pull out and get navigation. It l seems like every single application that's coming out now wants to use this pattern. Um, 
I don't think it's a good idea. Um, I think pattern should always, always be only used if you have the problem the pattern solves. Many of these applications don't actually have the problem. They just could design the, the UI to be easier to navigate. This, this side navigation has problems. Say, it's very difficult to discover. It uses the same app indicator to open the side thing. It's one more thing that happens with the app. And, uh, and you don't really know what happens with the back after you press one of these buttons. Uh, so only use the side navigation if you really need it. It's not bad pattern as such, but it's bad if you use it if you don't need it. Um, to, to help users keep the navigation flat, don't make deep navigations, because the navigation is already, already problematic on Android, especially if you have responsive UI, you have multiple different kinds of navigations. Uh, keep it really flat and always make sure that every screen the user knows exactly where they are. Um, I like this application, it's very good. Um, if you look at this application, you always know what's going on. The top is that it's your calendar, it's your artist, you have exactly, exactly understanding where you are. You have to remember that users might use your application, they might, might multitask out of it, they might put it on pockets in the Urban or, or whatever, and then they go back five minutes later, they don't remember what they did before. So your application, whenever you open any screen, it always shows exactly where you are and what you can do. Don't require users to remember anything. Um, bottom tabs are that. Um, this is, um, it's just, there's been arguments, uh, the bottom tabs are dead. Don't argue about it anymore. They go to the top, and that's over. Um, this is a cool application example, because after I took this screenshot, they re re redesigned it and they released it. So the reason why bottom tabs are exact, ex very bad is that you don't know the hierarchy of these things. And of course, they look like iOS tabs anyways. But you don't know the hierarchy of the tabs. If you have multiple tabs, multiple navigation layers, you don't know which one is which. On the left side, you don't know if the top tab top tabs are higher or the bottom tabs are higher. If you used iPhone, you probably know which one is higher. But if you haven't, you don't. On the right side, on the other hand, they, they removed the tabs, they made the pull down navigation, which is okay. And then there are tabs and below that. You ex know exactly what the hierarchy is, you know exactly what happens when you navigate. This is the right way to do it. Um, this is going away. Twitter finally fixed this in their application, which annoyed the hell out of me. Uh, let users swipe between tabs. Um, this reason is that there's, there's no reason not to, unless you have panning areas on the tabs, that's gonna be a bit more complex. Maybe go for bezel swipe. But uh, big screen phones, you can actually interact with the, with the tabs wherever you want. And other possible uh, positive thing about it is that the, the feeling of navigation when you swipe is much better. This is a natural thing to do. Tapping something that is flat that makes something else happen isn't. So this will feel great for the users. So when you create tabs, always use swipe swiping. Uh, menu button is dead. Um, finally, um, I don't know if the new, new Twitter application actually has still, still has the menu. Uh, the Google guys call this uh, the menu button of shame when this appears, these three dots. Uh, it's good. Um, unfortunately, some phones still ship with menu buttons like the, the latest Facebook phone, which is ridiculous. Um, but don't use this on the application. The only thing you need to do is to, to switch the, the API SDK target um, and it will go away, as long as you use action bar. The issue comes if you don't use action bar where you put your menu and so on. Ask your designers, they're good at it. <clears throat> use Android internet share. I think this problem doesn't exist anymore. This was like one year ago, this was really painful when you saw an application you wanted to share to Facebook, you had to write your login first. I was like, why would I have to do this? If I want to share something, just send the intent. This is literally two lines of code. Um, there is a reason to use uh, Facebook integration or Google Plus integration. Add that as alternative method. Always use intent and then allow users to, to sign in. Because if you sign into Facebook, you can control exactly how the share is going to look. And you can make some automatic stuff as well. Um, so there's reason to do that, but if you just share, always use this thing. Um, Android icons. Um, don't design your own icons if, if the platform already has icons. Um, share, for example. Um, when you first saw the share icon, that we now know share icon, um, 
it probably didn't know what it was. But it's used so widely as all the other icons that are available that everybody knows them now. So just use them. You don't have to explain what they are because everybody's using them on all applications, especially sharing and, and so on. Next presentation starting in a second. Um, on-screen back buttons. Um, this is the when you see when you see an on-screen back, back button on the application, you know that the developer and designers didn't know anything what they were doing. Then it gets uninstalled down. Um, Spiegel Online, uh, this application in Germany. This application is worth downloading uh, because they made every single mistake you can possibly do. <laughs> if they if they gone random UI, it would have been better. So let's go to download this application and. You see, they have this Zurich button and, and tabs and whatever. Um, so yeah, Android phones have back buttons. Use that, you just know how, how it works. Even though it has issues, it's still better than, than mixing multiple things. I like the back button. Um, don't use pop-up. This is one of the other, other pet peeves I have. Um, <coughs> never ever use pop-ups. Uh, this annoys me that I can get to, uh, for, I get to use example from Google, Google product to show. Um, this has changed as well, but this was so beautiful. here. This is Google TV uh, App Store, or uh, Google Play. When you go and, and install an application on Google Play, or used to on Google TV, um, when the installation is complete, they will pop up saying, hey, this is now ready, uh, you want to open it. And it doesn't matter where you are, you might be lo looking, reading some other text, and the pop-up will pop up saying, hey, I have this done. Um, don't use pop-ups. There's never a good reason to use pop-up. Um, if you think that you have an application where you're using, using pop-up, you can't design around it, um, you should ask, so ask some designers. They probably can do it. Um, pop-ups always interrupt the users. They always interrupt the flow. They lose the context of what the users are doing. Um, so don't use them. Uh, only if you're going to spend a week figuring out, I can't figure out how to do this. So then you use pop-up. But the first option is always never use, not to use them. Um, there's other alternatives. Um, so Evernote, for example, uses some notifications down there. I really like the way Google Plus does the, does the notification when you're offline. Uh, there's a couple of reasons, which is a very good example. Firstly, it never interrupts what you're doing. Uh, it just shows that, hey, I can't load more. So it's still using whatever you were doing. Secondly, it's, it's in the right place. Because the, the new, new things would come on the top. Like, they would be there, but they can't be there because you don't have, have connection. Uh, so, so when in doubt, do what the, what the Google Plus does with the, with the errors. That's very good. Um, and of course, notifications. We have the best notifications in, in, in the mobile industries. So use notifications whenever you're doing something that, that doesn't require insta immediate action or isn't an error or so on. Let's use, pop, use notifications. Uh, splash screens. Uh, there's no reason to use bus screens, they, they're useless. Uh, Android doesn't have the, the mechanism to make them really fast like iOS does. Uh, they just delay users from using the application. The Verge uses them because they probably have some sponsorship or something. I wish they didn't. Because um, basically, uh, users might use your application for five seconds. If three seconds of that is tearing at the splash screen, it's really annoying. Don't do that. Um, tutorial screens. Uh, don't use tutorial screens. They're useless. Uh, people don't, don't learn anything with them. Um, the problem is that the two problems. Firstly, people install applications all the time. And when they install it again and again and again, they have to go to the same stupid tu tutorial screens again, and they already know how to use it. Then you have the users who never used your application before. And they open the application, and the first thing they see is some tutorial screen. And they don't have any context. They don't understand what does this thing mean. You might be explaining this is this is this but they don't know what it is. Um, so don't do that. Uh, I have an example of an application I really love, but this is the worst tutorial screens I've seen. Um, Pocket. Uh, how many of you use Pocket? How many of you hate the tutorial screen every time you install it? Good, at least a couple. So you install the, install the thing, you sign up, sign in with your account, which is already kind of, you might be using it already if you sign in instead of login. Um, so first they have, have something like this, say hi, hey. I don't know why apps need to say hi. Um, <laughs> then you press next. Then you go like, all right. I don't care. Uh, next. Um, don't care. <laughs> next. There's no next. Where it gone? 
Now you have to press the damn thing you avoided for the, all the other screens. So don't do this. There's better ways to do it. I understand this. Um, I like, I think uh, Adam Powell from Google said that if you, if you failed, if you have to use Fedora screen, your design has failed. Right? I think it's a good, good guideline. Uh, but sometimes you might want to give something more and more, right? There's good ways to do it. Do what Evernote does. They don't pop it up for you, you but you users can go and ask more. Hey, I like this application. I've been using it for half a year. I, I, see, I want to see what else do they have. And they have two things right. Firstly, they don't force you to do it. Secondly, when you tap any of these, they take you exactly the same right screen and they highlight it in right context. You see in the background on the right side, you see the text composing area of, of new note. And it says, just tap here and it's going to work like this. And then you close this one and you're already on this right screen. Do this, don't do the previous one. Uh, forced logins, annoying as hell. Um, Twitter, if you go to twitter.com on, on your browser, you can see tweets. If you go to Twitter um, on your phone, you can't see anything. Why? Always let users use your application before you log in. Um, you can do something. You don't have to have full full thing, but you have, can have something. Uh, good, good, good instance. So, to, uh, example for example, these two applications do exactly the same thing. There's a competition: Catch Note and Evernote. Uh, Evernote, they usually love them. Uh, in this case, they are the ones that fall short. Um, so, on Evernote, you can do anything. You can swipe and see some tutorial screen. On the right hand side, you see on the Catch Note, which have the same tutorial screens. But this is the big difference. On the catch note, you can go, okay, um, I don't really want to spend time typing in my password and username, but I want to see what this app is about. And then you tap this one and you go into the note thing, and when you sign in, they actually sync your, sync your notes to these servers. Um, the Google Play Store and other, Play Store, other app stores on, on Android are so powerful tools when if your app gets featured on Google Play, you get million uploads, downloads. And what happens then if the users who don't know your application only see the login screen, they just go uninstall. Um, try to figure out, even if you think about, okay, this is just for my users who already use my service, so I can always make them log in. Try to think about the new users you could gain if you just let them try it first. You don't have to have full functionality, but let them try first. Uh, don't have status bar. Um, so, um, Status bar is something that tells the user something else was going on the phone. Um, don't think that users are using, using the phone just for your application. They didn't buy the phone for your application. They use the application that they happen to be using. Uh, it's, if your application is great. Um, Google Books used to hide it, don't hide it anymore. So if, imagine if you're reading a comic book and you hear the notification sound and if you have to press home and then go, okay, I didn't care about this spam. Annoying as hell, instead of you can see it. Do what Google Book does, um, so you can tap it and it brings down the action bar and the status bar. So always let them, let them do it. Um, I think this is my last point. Um, this is very important. Um, so if you, this is the people who come from, from Linux side of things, like I'm a, I'm a Linux user for ages. I just went to dark side a couple of years ago. But the, um, what do you see in the GNOME or KDE or whatever they say? The UI isn't bad, you just haven't set it up right. It's like you, need, you shouldn't have to set up the UI to make it right. So if you provide customization, it's not alternative to design. So if users are not designers, so don't do this. These are, these are screens, setting screens from one single application uh, where you can set up everything you can do. Um, there's no point to do this. You are the designers, you know how the application is best used. You should make, make it really easy to use the users. If you need to have some strange settings for, for UI, <coughs> hide them somewhere. Uh, the problem is twofold. Uh, firstly, it's useless. Secondly, there are settings that are needed. Users need to set up their data and so on. If you, if you build this, they won't find the things they actually need. So. You are the designers. You decide, define what, the, what you do. This is, these are a couple of examples that are really bad. Don't do this. Should I use pull to refresh to refresh? You decide. If you want to use pull to refresh, you put it in your application. If you don't like it, don't put it in your application. Um, should mentions be highlighted and so on, right? Um, oh, this is the last point. Uh, so, anyways, you are, not the, you are not your user. 
And if you want to verify that your application is great, put it in front of users. So do user testing. Um, formal usability testing is very expensive. Um, most companies can't do it. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't do something. Just put your application in front of your friends. Um, friends are quite bad um, in some sense because they, they like you because they're friends. Uh, so they won't say that the application sucks. There's a good trick what you can do. You can say, um, this is for other guys and our, and our team built this one and I want to see if you, if you like it. Lie to your friends. That's, that's my message. <laughs> uh, so this is from Will Wheaton. I always end, end up my things. Uh, don't be a dick. Be part, of the, be part of the platform. Create your application part of the platform. Don't make, don't make your application the only thing that's running on the, on the phone. Make good application. Thanks.